Hey everyone, I hope everyone have a good day, good evening, good morning, I don't care what you at, I hope you are doing fine. So the day topic will be how I grow into my disability pride or slash artistic pride. So it will be an iteracing journey. And also, this is the 30th, the 33 year of ADA or American with Disability Act came about to give the civil right to disabled people in the U.S. 33 years, still intact. And always talk about disability history. And since I'm going to go get into that in a minute, on how I uh, become comfortable in my disability and be proud of who I am. And I probably had mentioned it during the, um, uh, where I make a video about um, disability history month or disability pride month. So I might have missed it. But I'm going to explain how I got comfortable in my skin. So, my journey. I'm born in North Carolina. The youngest of seven children. The fourth daughter. To my dad. And the youngest on my mom's side. So my mom had me and my sister. Well, for my dad, I'm his sixth child. His fourth daughter and the baby of the family. <laughs> so, basically, I'm the baby in both families. So, yeah. And, um, and, um, just, you know, being the youngest of seven children, I'm the spoiled one. So, <laughs> Call you the younger, you always poor. So that me. Then, at two years old, I was diagnosed with autism. So this doctor told my mom that they could send me away during the weekend. But no, my mama, I'm her child. She's going to take care of me, as usual. And my big and my older sister. So yeah, she take care of me and my sister. Did it to the best she best she can. And of course, my family on my mom's side of the family trying to encourage me to talk. By the time I did not talk at the time, I just you know being the kid, not thinking about. What's wrong with me at the time? I was just being a kid, but I know I'm I'm a widow because I know me. I'm a widow, so I'm proud of that. So <laughs> black and weird, so let's say that in my own ways. So of course, being my family, having a whole lot of cookout, best in my grandma's house. I miss you, grandma. Yeah, I lost my grandma last month, y'all. She was 90 years old. I miss her, though. I'm going to miss her present, though. I'm going to miss her. And see her. See something else, though. But I love her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> my mom, mom. Yeah, see something else, though. But she a sweet lady. But she get on you, though. <laughs> But other than my grandma, no, um, I miss her though. We spend time with my family, especially my cousin. Cause I, I came from a big family, especially both sides of the family, actually. <laughs> I have a large family, a lot of cousins. Let's say that. First cousin, second, third, second cousin, third cousin. Just imagine. <laughs> and plus, I'm an auntie. So, yeah. So, um, 
can you imagine be the youngest and always an auntie? <laughs> I don't understand. Like, literally, I just don't understand. But, yeah. Um, but other than that, I do remember something part of my life. Basically, basically in elementary school. You know, of course, I was the only girl in the special education class in elementary school. I was the only girl. Full boys. You could make sure I'd be all the work for the boys. <laughs> Maybe a tomboy. You could be why I came a tomboy as I got older. Because I so used to being my boys all the time. So I'm kind of used to it. And um, I guess um, I thought having, I guess, y'all, um, for uh, disabled people, especially disabled children, have like some specialists or somebody work with you, um, work on your um, life skill, how to count money, take care of yourself, etc. And me going feet speech therapy growing up. Cause, uh, you could, y'all could tell right now I went to feet therapy here. Hey, B, yeah, it's a fucking a lot. <laughs> and um, all that growing up and teaching life skill. And um, so, um, of course, at the time, yeah, you know, I thought they were babysitting me, but <laughs> at the time, I'm like, oh, I thought it was just normal, you know, but. Yeah, but, um, yeah. So, uh, of course, I went to cat elementary school as normal, even though I was placed in a special education class. Made some acquaintances with, you know, my peers who, who don't have disability, but not really that much, though. I don't have many interactions with my non disabled peers in elementary school. But yeah, based on my experiences. So I'm mostly being around disabled people majority of the time. And while with the person I with, Miss Lowy, she she a loving woman. She a white woman, but she's sweet though. A Christian woman, which she is. So and her, and she had two children, a son and a daughter, Lindsay and Nick. And we kind of grew up together, so cause she always have us around. So I thought she was babysitting me <laughs> because my mom always work and my dad, you know, he retired, but he something he cut people grass because he retired. So yeah, so um. Doing that, you know, extra stuff growing up. Um, then I went to middle school because basically how the middle school is, it's like they have two schools in the same building. It'd be like half of the building will go for, for a school for disabled student and the other half is for just regular middle school right in the same building but half half for um disabled student half for you know for knowing people right i will place in the um you know school with disabled people in it in my sixth grade year knowing me how it curious and of course be anticipating trying to observe your environment and stuff like that and being around Oh, it came us one to learn by thing. I guess I'm a quick learner. I love, I love things. So, all this stuff. And I remember my seventh grade year. Um, I was placed in the other school in the same building. It's called Haynes. And while the well, the um, the school for disabled people called Lawrence, but they call it Haynes Lawrence Middle School. That wasn't how they name it, but Lawrence for disabled student, 
and hang for for the known people. So they so they um, placed me in Haynes Middle School. You know, with Haynes Middle School, they got uniform, so I had to wear uniform and shit. <laughs> and um, I've been there for my seventh grade year and eighth grade year. You know, taking normal classes. But the one thing I think study skill class, you know, we, I will see all my desire up here and we do our homework and learn about different things and things like that. So, and I, and of course, I may have um, experienced some bullying in my seventh grade year, but not so much my eighth grade year, but my seventh grade year, it was kind of some bullying because I formed the Lorraine School. So, yeah, it was kind of rough. But I ain't rough, but, you know, people kind of look at me funny and a little bit bullying and stuff like that. And I got, yeah, so, um, and I made my, um, my friend, met my friend, um, Tam, well, my BFF, who also a black autistic woman myself. I met her in my sixth grade year and she was her, in her seventh. So, um, we came clicking and we had fun and spend the night as normal middle school will do. Then as we got older to teenagers, you know, same thing as well. Um, so, um, with when Hang Middle School, I take a regular class, or they call it mainstream class, and, and this is where I had, you know, attend to my IEP meeting. So I don't know what that about, but I did anyway. So of course my mom always come, but I would try to get my dad, but you know he always busy. So I, my mom always my advocate for me, ever since I could remember. So yeah, so um. So, um, basically, of course, with IEP, they check when you know my progress and whatever may be the case. And me being in Haines Middle School, I make A's and B's. So, I'm pretty smart student, you know. I'm pretty, like, you know, smart. I'm curious, girl, you know. I, like, make sure I do my homework, make sure I study, you know, me a studious child, which I was. Maybe a nerd, let's say that. <laughs> a black over the car blurred. <laughs> I'm a blurred. I'm a black nerd. So I'm definitely a nerd back then. And a little bit awkward, I guess, you being autistic and, and trying to understand. So clearly, of course, it'd be fucking awkward. So, yeah. And after middle school, um, I went to high school, all black high school. So that is an experience. <laughs> well, not interesting, but of course, based on my high school at the time, you know, since we in a black neighborhood, you know, based on our surrounding, you know, I live in a black neighborhood and stuff like that. And they always say thing about my high school, like they always the bad kid go there and always fight and no one cared and blah blah. I used to think that too because of course back then I got some anti blackness in me and core hearing around, you know, black people ain't these and blah blah yeah, you can't hear that growing up and something. I don't believe that myself. You know unquote better than the bad kids in that place, you know. But yeah. So I was trying to get that H out of there, but I changed my mind. So, yeah. So, and plus, there's some kind of incident back my freshman year. I guess I should call you, you know, teenagers, stuff. You want to fit in, right? But I did not know at the time. Um, they doing some courting, whatever. And I think I was dancing, whatever. I don't fucking remember. But uh, they would call me and post me on the internet. And I guess people say something about me and probably bully me on the internet. 
with me not knowing social clues and shit. I guess I will bully forward and it could be why I want to, you know, move from other schools. So I don't want to continue to get bullied and stuff. And yeah. My freshman year, they kind of suck. And plus, I was placed in special education class or whatever. And, um, yeah. So, um, in my first semester there, I was going to say peace. I'm going to move to other, other school stuff. But I changed my mind. I guess I don't want to be weak, whatever. I don't know. There's a lot. <laughs> And plus, I played basketball back in um, high school. Well, throughout my high school year. And even despite the case, we ended up losing every fucking game. But we got a few wins. But a lot of times, we we be losing. So, yeah. But, um, yeah. And like they did back in middle school, they played me in mainstream classes or I call it regular classes and um you know do my you know being being a good student as I am making A's B but I think there might be a few cases back in Michigan I made two or three C's but majority of the time I'm mostly a good student so I do what I gotta do, you know, I'm a smart booty, I'm you know, but, um, yeah, oh, dang, I forgot, um, to mention that, um, how I learned about my disability, I forgot that part, but how I learned about my disability at 10, y'all probably heard the story a thousand times, so I, I learned about my disability at 10, my mom told me, don't let it define you, blah, 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 that, and, um, you know, at that age, I was okay learning about my disability, but I wasn't ashamed of it. You know, quote, when you hear from your family that you, quote, higher functioning autistic person, right? And, you know, that kind of smart, kind of good with numbers, you know, of course, put you in the box because you're autistic, right? So, um, yeah, and then call me, like, do some research, like, about my own disability and blah 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 that and, and quote how you're functioning and I think I thought I developed this mentality that I'm kind of better than those with high support need ignorant so yeah and the whole lot internalized ableism and not liking myself in the process it kind of grew probably into high school Middle school, yes, no, but not really. But high school, really, yeah. And core in high school, you want to fit in. And core me got humiliated in my freshman year. It was bad. So, it wasn't bad, but I don't know. It's hard to explain. It's like I feel more ashamed of why not getting the, you know, the sorts of clues. I was getting frustrated, you know, not getting why people bullying me. But I, yes, I know I have autism, but I just don't get it, you know. I guess me, you know, at the time, you know, used to be the question, used to pray, like, why I have all this issue, why me, all this stuff. And of course, you have people, you know, have Kayla talk when I was young and I would say, oh, she could overcome her disability, even though they not tend to say that way, but how they kind of said it. You know, of course, you, people keep telling you, like, oh, she's small, oh, she quote, high and functioning and stuff. And I guess I developed a whole lot of internalized ableism and of course, with your family, may not realize like they put harm to you, make you feel, you know, like you stupid. Like, why you not comprehend this better? Well, maybe the case where well, I intentionally make you feel like shit. And I feel some type of way about it. And I guess that grew in my, you know, you know, being hard on myself. I guess something called masking. 
try to pretend I'm okay, but knowing deep inside I'm losing my shit. So, and and sadly, at 16, I thought about underlying myself. I ain't told nobody this, but yeah, but um. Yeah, I had being a teenager kind of rocky, and also, along with that part, that I would question my sexuality whether or not I'm bi or not. So it's, it's a whole lot <laughs> I had to deal with. So, fast forward after high school, and um, you know, I learned about the disability community on Twitter, and of course, going to community college to get my education. And on forward, right? And then when I learned about disability history and talk about what it's like to be disabled, feeling discriminated, and microaggression, and all this stuff as a disabled person. And I felt related and also find the autistic community. Nor would it feel like, like having inter- internalized ableism and all this stuff going on. Learn about disability history. I'm like, why did I not learn about it, you know, in my life, you know? Because especially with my disability, particularly, always bad all the time, especially with autism. It's always negative all the time. So I think learn about disability history and learn about the autistic community and how they came to be. And I thought in, to create two events about autism at my community college and also using me as a speaker and along with other people I bring in, you know, talk about autism awareness or autism accepted. It's like a fucking battle, you know, whether you use awareness or accepting, you know. But yeah. So um I learned a lot and educating myself and also working on my internalized ableism and also being more comfortable in my own skin, being disabled or being autistic, being prideful or who I am as a person. Yes, I might have difficulty. Yes, I have a disability. It's nothing to be ashamed of. For a long time, I feel ashamed of my disability. So that I wish I never have it. So I wish I was normal. But I learn now what is normal. And... I am my own normal, but I didn't accept that for a long time. I was so busy trying to fit in and stuff growing up instead of just being myself. Well, I always be myself, but I guess I'm trying to fit in so people don't think me as weird and stuff, but awkward. So, and also not understand your limit as a to the person related to burning and meltdown and all this stuff. That's something I need to figure out. So so that I can kinda of feel jealous of my autistic peers. They know they burn out stuff. While me on here like survival mode all the time, I can't even tell whether or not I'm having a burnout or not. So I'm in survival mode. And if that you being black in America, you always have to fucking fight. So and spe- oh, especially a black woman. Oh, fuck yeah. You always have a goddamn fight. Every day. So, yeah. I may not be realizing I'm in, you know, survival mode all the fucking time. So, yeah. Basically, being a black woman in America who has been autistic, it's kind of weird accommodation. Weird, um, weird accommodation. Being black woman, people don't like you. People just say they use it for, like, fix they stub and then dispatch you and all this stuff. Be autistic. No one stand you. They think you a mystery and all that shit. Mix that bitch together. You always fucking a mystery. So it's like and always angry. So yeah. And weird. So kind of fit in it. Also act white. So it's like eh, don't know where you belong, boy. So um yeah, that would kind of feel a little bit about myself kind of growing up so then me you know learn about my disability and also learn about intersectionality and i and i learned that intersectionality that talk about having multiple identity at one time like 
for me, for example, have be a black autistic queer woman, you know, having different different intersectionality made up your experiences. So yeah. So as I lean toward about intersectionality and also learn about black people, um, you know, contribution to the disability community and all that stuff, I was amazed, you know. And not that far for black disabled um people and at, of course as well as uh black and brown disabled people and black and brown autistic people as well. And also I thought to create the hashtag black autistic pride autistic pride it was originally autistic black pride to talk to celebrate being black and autistic and being proud for who I am. Because, you know, here and there growing up, you all I had to be proud of being black because, of course, being black is a man. They always demean you. They make you feel like crap and all this stuff going on. Of course, I'm going to be proud for being black. But also, I'm going to be proud for and be comfortable with my own disability as well. So that's why I create that hashtag, you know, be proud for being black and autistic. And, of course, you know, some people fail to intersectionality part of the BS. Woo! That was some fucking work. But anyway, so I create the hashtag and come more comfortable and and also lean toward intersectional, you know, approach, especially when it comes to autism. Because I did not know there's so many disputy in the autism community. So I do know the gender disparity in the autism community. I remember doing my research when I was a little girl. I know that fucking exists. But I did not know there were ways of disparity. And I remember questioning myself a lot of times. If I did not get diagnosed at two years old, would I be undiagnosed years later or never get autism at all? I kind of wonder. But it's not in my case. But it having case to my peers who have been, you know, Black films find out they autistic late in life, so I don't know what it's like to be late diagnosed. So I don't know that part, but it gotta be worth not knowing that you're autistic the whole time. So it gotta be worth. So um, yeah, and, um, so I learned about disability justice, which is talk about. Of course, talk about disability, but also talk about intersectionality within disability. And I learned that a lot, a lot, a lot. And also, Hispanic, talk about more. And I'm also one of the more representation of um, Black and Brown autistic people and want more recognition in the autistic community. And of course, I get some backlash for it. You know, I'm being bold with my statement, you know. But you know how some people in the community don't want to check their body, see? So, um, yeah. So I be doing advocacy work for five years. And I'm 25 now. So I started doing advocacy work, uh, I think I was 20 years old. 20. I was 20 years old. So, yeah, I did it for five years. Can't believe it, right? <laughs> uh, um... I have to do what I do and uh, do what needs to be said, you know. One more people who like me who are autistic and black, you know, and talk about intersectionality because intersectionality is my jam, okay? And also, um, I came more comfortable in my skin being disabled and, and, think, and also know that disability is not a bad word, so... That far, OB autistic is a bad word. So, um, learn about this be here soon when I ever had a chance, and also get some books, and also share my story with like to be me, you know, all that good old stuff, and following disabled activists, bad butts, <laughs> and c- continue to share my experience with like to be me. And and also, by now, since I'm 25, I'm still in my, you know, learning about myself, who I am, that person, or who I am supposed to be. And I would like for much of my life, I'll always want people to accept me as I am. Like, I don't 
want want people to love me as I am because for a very long time I did not accept me. And I made like some part of my life I wanted to give up, but I didn't give up, even though I want to, but I didn't. So I'm glad that I pushed through found the DCB community on Twitter. If not, I don't know what I would do in my life, if I'll be honest. But I don't know if Universal God want me to be an activist and talk about it. Maybe I thank him or her for that. For giving this, you know, this voice I have to change people's perspective. And also bring the intersectionality part of it too, good baby. Everything is so one sided. You all you had to talk about race, disability, sexism, but not if you other than that. So there's a lot. So you know I'm just out here doing my thing, but I kinda of slow down with my FQ a little bit. But I still go advocate. But right now, you know, I'm in school, so that's a juggle. And also working, so that's a juggle already. So um in the future, y'all, you know, whenever I get my degree from UC UC Greensboro, don't major in county finance and may continue my education to get my master in accounting. And my goal is to become a CPA or certified public accountant that work for a nonprofit organization. So it would make sense for me since I am an advocate and love to be advocacy work. So that I love to do. So it makes sense to do what I love. So I'll we go that route. So now y'all know. If things have changed the future, y'all will know too. Who knows? I don't know what my future holds for me. And also being comfortable who I am as a person and accepting as I am as a black artistic queer woman, being comfortable who I am. And also, so that I'd be listening to some song like Take Me As I Am by Mary J. Blood, Sacrifice by The Weeknd, and listen to the whole album of Janae Monet of The Age of Pleasure. It's about them exploring their sexuality, sex, etc. I think I like that song, for example, because me being comfortable in my queer identity, it makes sense for me why I feel resonate to that song. Come, it's like for me, it's like a a journey of self discovery for me. Cause throughout my life, you know, I was like eh, live my life. Then of course, learn about your disability and in a journey like you did not like yourself and not understand your disability, having a whole lot of internalized ableism back then, and think about allowing yourself at some point because you wish you were normal and then finding me finding the disability community on twitter and other social media platform i think they saved me for myself and also be comfortable in my own identity and also learn about the intersectionality of who i am become my voice matter my lived experience matter not everything had to be one-sided or whitewash all the damn time share your story and live your truth so that's what I learned from my experience for me. I don't know what, what it's like for everybody. I think I want to be me. Authentic me. Not to shoot record it. Because for during my life, I did not accept myself who I am. I try to be somebody that I'm not. And so that I'm tired of living a mask every fucking day. And I didn't want to be me. And if people can't accept me as I am, it's a damn problem, not a big problem. If God made it this way, oh well. <laughs> so, um, I want to know what y'all disability pride journey be like. So, what like for you since uh, July go to end soon? And what your disability pride month for you? So, if you have disability. So, I hope everyone have a good day. Bye, y'all.